Okay, so now we're going to talk about the how of masking. Now that we know why we mask, let's talk about how we mask. So first, for air conduction, we need to mask for air conduction when either the current intensity level in the test ear is greater than or equal to the thresh, the air conduction threshold in the non-test ear at the same frequency plus interoral attenuation because that means that the two, that the signal in the test ear could be crossing over. It means that it's equal to what could cross over um, and therefore we can't rule crossover out. But what you also have to keep in mind is that any time the intensity in the test ear is, it should actually be measured from any time the intensity in the test ear is greater than or equal to the bone conduction threshold at that frequency in the non-test ear plus intraoral attenuation. But this poses a problem in clinical practice because typically people acquire air conduction thresholds first and bone conduction thresholds last. So, um, while the second one is, is really theoretically what should happen, more often what you're using to guide your masking is the first. For bone conduction, you mask for bone conduction anytime you need to know specifically which ear the bone conduction threshold is coming from. Um, so if air conduction is asymmetric, or any time an air bone gap that is 15 dB or more exists between best bone and air conduction thresholds for that ear. Um, so an air bone gap of 10 is permissible, an air bone gap of 15 or more is really considered problematic, and then you would need mask thresholds for that ear. For speech, we mask when the intensity level of speech is greater than or equal to bone threshold plus intraoral attenuation. And again, you may not always know bone conduction threshold when you're doing speech, so sometimes air conduction thresholds are used here instead. The stimuli that we're using for masking, um, typically the audiometer is actually going to auto-select it. So if you're on tones on channel 1, channel 2 is going to be on narrowband noise. If you're on speech in channel 1, channel 2 is automatically going to switch to the appropriate masker, which is speech noise. Um, this website is a good sort of practice for when do you need masking. So the next question, once you've figured out when masking is needed, is how much masking is needed. And there's two um, different methods we're going to talk about to calculate this. The first method is called the step method or the dump method. I'm still working on getting the original citation for this method. It comes from one of the older versions of the CATS book, which I have, but it's in a box somewhere. Um, there's also a very handy chart that's easy to use that is in that same book chapter. So I'm working on the original citation for this, but I'm still going to tell you the mechanics of it. And then there's the plateau method. The plateau method was originally devised by Linda Hood, but modifications and adaptations have been made over time. Um, we're going to talk about the plateau method that is described in uh, Turner 2004 um, article in JAAA. For the dump method, and the reason that I like the dump method, the idea is you just dump all the masking in. Um, and so for this, you have, so remember, you're testing, you're testing on channel 1, and you have channel 2 available for the non-test ear to mask if masking is needed. So you're testing in channel 1, and this assumes you already have thresholds for the non-test ear, so the, that the test ear is the second ear. So for channel 1, you're testing and you obtain a threshold, but you've increased in intensity so much that when you look at the difference between um, the test ear and the non-test ear in your transducer, you realize, oh, there could be crossover happening, I need to mask now. Um, so you need masking to verify the threshold that you already obtained. So next, you're going to present the tone again at the same intensity while at the same time 
in the non-test ear, you turn on the appropriate masking noise at 30 or 35 dB above the air conduction threshold. You're going to use 35 dB at 500 hertz and 30 dB at all other frequencies. And then in the test ear, you're going to increase your presentation by 5 the same way you would for anything else until the patient responds. And you don't have to add any more masking unless you go up 15 dB from the original potential threshold that you got at the beginning. If you go up by 15 dB in the test ear, then you add 15 dB more of masking in the non-test ear. So let me give you an example. Let's say you're testing at 1000 Hz, you're using um, headphones as your transducer, so you're using an interoral attenuation value of 40 dB. The air conduction threshold in the non-test ear is 15 dB. So here's what happens. You're going to do all the air conduction testing in the better ear. You're going to start testing the worse ear, and you're going to start without masking. And as you get a threshold, you're going to notice, oh, hey, masking is needed. This threshold is highly asymmetric from the uh, threshold in the opposite ear. And as you go, you're going to verify the thresholds using masking. And you're going to say something to the patient like, you're going to hear some static noise come on and off. I just want you to ignore it completely and raise your hands when you hear the beeps. So, you're testing in the test ear. And you increase intensity and the patient doesn't respond until you get to 70 dB. Well, 70 dB and 15 dB, which is the air conduction threshold in the non-test ear, are very far apart. They're clearly more far apart than 40 dB. So masking is needed. So you put masking in at 45 dB HL in the non-test ear. And you present the tone again at 70 dB. And there's no patient response. You present the tone at 75, and there's no patient response. And you present the tone at 80, and the patient says, yep, I heard it. Now, your 80 is not 15 dB higher than where you started, which was 70. So, you're done. You can present at 80 one more time to be certain. The patient hears it. You've got two out of three, um, and you don't need to add any more masking at any point. Um, so here's another scenario. Uh, with the same setup, Let's say you test at 7, you apply masking, you apply 45 dB, um, masking at 45 dB because you took the 15 dB that was the threshold and you added 30 to it because you're at 1000 Hertz. You play tone at 70, no response. Tone at 75, no response. Tone at 80, no response. At 85, the patient gives you a positive response. Well now, 85 has gone up 15 from 70. So now you're going to test again. You're going to dump an extra 15 dB of masking in, and you're going to verify the 85 dB threshold, which you do. Patient responds, yes, I heard it, and then you can call that the masked threshold. That's the dump method in a nutshell. The plateau method has a couple more steps. So let's say you're in the same scenario. With the plateau method, you're going to put masking, start masking at 10 dB above the air conduction threshold. And then you're going to play the tone in the test ear at the same level. And increase by 5 until the patient responds. Once the patient responds, you're going to increase the masking by 5 dB and test the tone threshold again. And you have to do this three times in a row with no change in response. So here, so you get your first response at 70 dB. And, and again, same exact setup, air conduction threshold is 15. So you know you have to mask. You mask using the plateau method. So first, you're going to put masking in at 25, because that's 10 dB above the 15 dB threshold. You test at 70, no response. 75, no response. 80, you get a positive response. Next, you're going to increase the masking 30 dB and retest 80. And you get a positive response. Next, you're going to increase masking by 5 again and test at 
have masking at 35 and check the threshold at 80 dB. You still get a positive response. And then you're going to do it one last time so you have turned the masking up by 5 three different times in a row. So you're going to mask at 40 and present at 80. Patient heard it, great, 80 dB is the mask threshold. However, this can get a little bit tedious. So let's say you do it again. Masking starts at 25. You test at 70, no response, 75, no response, 80, they get it, great. You turn the masking up to 30, test at 80, they have a positive response. Again, you turn the masking up again to 35, you test at 80, and now there's no response. Ugh. So now you have to keep going. You go up by 5, you test at 85, you're still using masking noise. You test at 85 and they respond. Well now you have to go up three times in increments of five from 35 because you need three responses where the threshold doesn't change. So you're going to do masking then at 40 and check the threshold. Masking at 45 and check the threshold and masking at 50 to check the threshold. Um, so that's the plateau method. It tends to have a little bit more steps um, sometimes uh, it's, it's going to come down to sort of a clinic protocol and preference as to which you like to use, which method for masking you like to use best. We also have to talk about over masking. So intensity can be a bit of an issue with masking. So putting masking in at 100 dB is probably going to be too loud for somebody to tolerate. And in the case of speech, sometimes with having masking noise in the non-test ear is distracting and the person doesn't do as well in speech. Overmasking is when the masking noise is so intense in the non-test ear that it could cross over. Um, you see this happen a lot in the headphones because the intraoral attenuation is low. So if masking in the non-test ear is 41 dB or more above the threshold in the test ear, then you're in an overmasking situation. For inserts, you have a bit more wiggle room because the intraoral attenuation is typically about 65. Um, and with overmasking, uh, you're going to run into the masking dilemma when you can't put enough masking in to satisfy the masking rules that you're using. So when applying the appropriate amount of masking would lead to overmasking, then you're in a masking dilemma. Because unmasked, you can't be sure that it's from the test ear, but if you do the correct amount of masking, then you're going to risk the masking crossing over. This is the masking dilemma. Typically, it only becomes a problem when you're dealing with a case of unilateral conductive hearing loss or unilateral mixed hearing loss or highly asymmetric conductive or mixed hearing loss. When you can't mask enough to be effective without over masking. In some cases you may not actually be able to obtain a true threshold in this case. Um, you note it on the audiogram, usually people put a little asterisk by it and note um, masking dilemma. Um, and then other audiologists will know what that means.